Christie and welcome back. So um, we've got a few things to go through this time and do please feel free to jump in at any point. Um, firstly, it's a long time since we did our last call so if you're anything like me, it probably took a while to remember what on earth we talked about. So uh, you may have noticed that I uh, finally uh, sneaked the, um, the notes from the 19th of December onto the website. I don't know if anybody's had a chance to look at those. Um, but just to re just to reiterate what we did last time, we took a bit of a deep dive into partnerships. But the reason we did that was to gain some understanding of the kinds of relationship of ownership and control that can exist more widely than just in limited companies. So remember, we started off at the beginning looking at uh, very basic uh, relationships that arise from the holding of shares and specifically control relationships arising from the holding of voting shares and so we wanted to look at the uh, the more general situations and to do that we looked at some of the different structures that exist in partnerships and the different kinds of both ownership and control that come with those with a view to then creating a more general hierarchy of ownership and control relationships. So I'll start by just running through some of the things that have been added to the model. I've done a simplified diagram that, oh, uh, something a bit of an echo there. You can also uh, mute uh, locally and uh, if you are on telephone, just click the button called telephone on your... <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, let's just start by having a look at this uh, basic taxonomy of kinds of entity that we have and then we'll look at some of the changes we did in partnerships and then look at how I've applied that to create a uh, at least a straw man or a tentative starting point for uh, hierarchies of ownership and control that cover uh, types of entity more broadly than just limited companies. So firstly just a reminder at the very top of our uh, area of interest we have this concept of an autonomous entity uh, what some models might call a party but we use that word for uh, something closer to its English meaning this is anything that can basically do stuff on its own behalf um, and of those of course we have human beings or people uh, we have organizations which are collections of autonomous entities which may themselves be human beings, other organizations and so on. And then we have the concept of legal personhood where a legal person, so this blue color indicates this is something that is capable of uh, incurring liability on its own part. And that's distinct from what we had over here, this what the LEI ISO 17442 refers to as legal entity but in the legal world, legal entity is usually a synonym for legal person, so we haven't used the word at all. We have contractually capable entity, that's anything that can enter into a contract, and all of the ones that we're interested in for LEI purposes are really kinds of formal organization. So then legal persons, uh, you have natural persons, that's human beings who are, are not minors, um, there's obviously other nuances to that that we haven't captured. Um, and all the other kinds of legal person are basically what's called a legal fiction. We've added a few. We had as well as natural persons and you know, non-natural, what we call body corporate. There are some legal persons that are not actually formal organizations. So if I trundle over here, you'll see that from organization, we have informal and formal. Under informal, we had things like cartels and so on, which are elsewhere in the model. Um, oh, I forgot to turn off that email. Uh, then we have formal organization, which is any organization that has some formal, uh, 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 some, some formal contract among the principles, some formal standing, and that includes things like trusts and partnerships and so on. And uh, what we call body corporate, we used to call it an artificial legal person. This is some legal person that's not a natural person and is a formal organization. Now what's new is that we identified, just as we went through some of the early reviews, um, sovereign that was already there, municipality I'm less sure about, and things like bodies created by statute or by uh, legal charter, typically like regulators, universities, things like that that have legal personhood, 
maybe they're organizations as well, maybe they're not, um, but they're legal persons. So we just put those there. Um, but the main ones we're interested in really are formal organizations, and those are either also legal persons, i.e. body corporate, things like, uh, and there's actually two ways they can be incorporated in general, by equity or by the issuance of, of guarantees. Um, and then, of course, bodies incorporated by equity include incorporated companies. They also include certain kinds of partnerships. Now, the work we did last time with partnerships um, we took out the, um, the jurisdiction-specific examples of limited liability partnership and limited liability company and so on, and we identified a number of facets by which partnerships can be described. So in fact, most of those specific ones, we had an interesting one last time called limited liability limited partnership, <laughs> which describes several facets all in play, all in one go. So we haven't tried to capture all of those names, which are very uh, jurisdiction specific. Um, we've simply said, well, partnerships either have general partners or limited partners or both. You'll see that these are not shown as mutually exclusive. A typical partnership that's not incorporated just has general partners. Uh, normally, with limited partners, you have you become a body corporate, but there were some, according to one note, that are not. So this may uh, need to be reviewed. But that's uh, we've got ones with only limited partners, so clearly body corporate, because the nature of the general partners is that they have uh, uh, joint and several liability, um, and so liability passes through to them. It's not held by the entity itself. Clearly, if they're not general partners, then uh, the thing is a legal person. In fact, many of these others. Um, the jurisdiction specific variants that combine some of these facets will also be um, legal persons, as we'll see. Then we also have trusts. We did a lot of work on trusts earlier in the context of funds and so on. And we have foundations, which um, I was a bit of a puzzle as to whether those were legal persons or not. And I've done some research on that. And some typically civil law jurisdictions confer legal personhood on foundations and have particular bodies of law that define founding articles which have the same kind of standing as your articles of association of a limited company. Other typically common law jurisdictions like England and the United States and so on um, don't have that sort of arrangement and foundation is normally a term that just describes the kind of charitable body. There are exceptions of course, um, but there's a, that's something I, I, I don't intend to try and uh, firm up at the moment. But just to note that in general, you have foundations as a kind of formal organization, you have trust, you have partnerships. So the work we did on partnerships, let me just have a small uh, dive into that, and then uh, I'll show you how we've uh, been able to take the um, uh, uh, things that exist here and start describing ownership and control more generally than just in the limited company terms that we had before. So. In partnership, here's the more detailed model of this. Partnership is an organization, of course. Um, it's a formal organization. Formal organizations are anything with some formal covering agreement among the principles. Those covering agreements typically cover things like uh, the division of equity, the division of liability, um, and various other things that the uh, principles in the organization agree upon. A partnership is just such an organization. It has a covering agreement called a partnership agreement. I've uh, added a couple of kinds of contractual term to that. That needs more work still. Um, then, as we saw in the simple hierarchy just now, partnerships typically, if not always, have general partners. Um, I've described a concept that's simply a partnership partner. We don't really need to refer to much because generally um, there are some partnerships that don't have general partners, but uh, the partners that actually exist are either general partners or limited partners uh, or both of those or just one or just the other. So we've then defined, as with all these parties, these are organization members, they're formal organization members, they're members of a formal organization, and of course all parties are something in some role, uh, some entity in some role, and the entity in a role is this identity relationship. Any organization member is some what we call potential party. This is any 
anything that can basically carry out any of these roles. So that could be a person, it could be an informal organization, it can be a, a formal organization and so on. Um, we then use that identity relationship, if I scroll back to the right here, to um, refine what are the necessary uh, entities that can fulfill the particular roles defined by these kind of uh, party icons. And so, for example, um, and I, I hope this is right, I'd like to know from the legal folks if it is or isn't, to be a partner in a partnership, you need to at least be a legal person. Um, I'm, I'm asserting here, rightly or wrongly, that you can't be um, a non-legal person and be a partner in a partnership uh, because, uh, particularly for the general partners at least, the liabilities are passed through to, uh, to those individuals. Um, again, I've asserted rightly or wrongly that the general partners uh, must be natural persons, that's people, human beings. Um, the limited partners are not so constrained. They're not constrained to be anything other than legal persons. Again, if that's incorrect and if informal organizations, for example, can be limited partners, we need to know because I'm asserting here what I think is the case in order to find out whether it's true or not. The partnerships have general partners and limited partners. I've defined different facets here. Partners with general partners, the partnerships with limited partners, fairly self-explanatory. Um, then, of course, you have partnerships with only limited partners, partnerships with general and limited partners, and separately from that, a separate facet which distinguishes a couple of the um, types of US partnerships that are uh, limited liability company and limited liability partnership are whether those limited partners must themselves be natural persons or corporate persons. And so there again we constrain the range of entities that can fulfill this role that's rec re represented by this party uh, icon to being effectively either a natural person or a body corporate. So we've defined the kinds of parties that exist as partners, the uh, kinds of partnerships that exist based on what kinds of things can be those partners and what combinations of those partners exist. And that should, we can go back and review this another time, but that should cover most of the US and UK variants that we saw. Now, having done that, and that's just a very basic um, uh, taxonomy of kinds of partnership and the different facets. We talked last time about a sort of Venn diagram, and that's essentially what this modeling format allows us to do, because each of these boxes is itself a, 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 a set. It's a, a set theoretic construct that says that um, things can be a member of this set or that set, where we show that they're mutually exclusive, then an individual can't be a member of both sets. So, for example, the partnership either has only limited partners or it has general and limited partners. And then separately and non mutually exclusively from that is whether those limited partners are themselves uh, corporates or human beings. And that defines particular individual kinds of partnerships in particular jurisdictions with different names and so on. There's also a weird one um, where the general partners have limited liability. I'm not sure how best to model that because in general we're talking in terms of general partners being entities that have some liability. So there's a little bit of a red flag against that, that one. Now having put that basic taxonomy in place, we could firm up on some of the details we talked about last time. In particular we talked about the equity in the partnership. So I've gone to the accounting model and pulled out the concept of equity um, that was already in play for things like uh, stockholder equity as we'll see shortly. Um, and so here we're taking these same concepts of partners, the general partner and the limited partner, and they hold different classes of equity. This is what we learned last time if you uh, have a look at the notes. You'll see this is all reflecting uh, the, the notes we took last time and little tables that I created defining that. The other thing about the general partner is they have the capacity for liability. So when you're looking at, you know, we define a legal person as being something that has the capacity for liability. A partnership may or may not be a legal person, and uh, where there are general partners, those general partners uh, carry the liability, so that liability is passed through. If the partnership incurs debts and you sue that partnership, the liability passes through to the general partners, not, of course, the limited partners. So this is what this is trying to reflect. So now we're defining these parties both in terms of the kinds of equity they hold 
the kinds of liability that they have the capacity for. Um, also, as I mentioned, we talked about how the organization covering agreement has terms about the apportionment of liability and terms about the apportionment of equity. Um, we probably need to spend a bit of time later on expanding that both for partnerships and also for trusts, as we talked about before, and look at what, if any, refinement is needed on these kinds of sets of terms. At the moment, we've simply asserted that they exist. So that gives us um, some uh, clarity. This is really just implementing the, uh, the fairly clear and detailed uh, um, input that we got last time on the kinds of ownership and the kinds of control that exists for partnerships and therefore which are um, not restricted to you know, just um, um, limited companies or, or, or just formal organizations or whatever. So this was our attempt to try and uh, um, generalize uh, types of control and types of ownership so that we're uh, talking about them at the, at the right level of uh, abstraction. So with that in place, I've then created a couple of new diagrams, one covering all of the control relationships and the kinds of control and the kinds of party that exercise those kinds of control and the kinds of thing that those kinds of party can be, and another one pretty much the same for ownership. Again, you'll see looking at the, uh, the kinds of equity that different owning parties hold by virtue of their uh, uh, participation in some kind of uh, ownership relationship. So I think I'll pause for breath there. Um, I don't want to do a deep dive into partnerships as such this time other than to pick up any glaring errors. The main aim of doing the deep dive we did last time was to uh, then be able to talk about ownership and control uh, outside of the context of, of your basic uh, company incorporated by shares. And so uh, that was really the, the thinking behind that. But I'd love to get any any feedback or immediate comments or, or um, errors that we need to correct uh, in well, what I've shown uh, so far. A business entity conference call, but I'm on mute. Hi, Mike. So um, I think Mike's on mute. Um, good. So. Uh, yeah, do have a look at those. Sorry, Mike, I thought I was a mute, but now I am. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. So you are. <laughs> no problem. hope it makes sense so far. Uh, it was a bit of a quick whistle-stop tour of the um, changes since last time in order to uh, set the scene for this time. Um, did you want to jump in with any quick comments, or uh, are we all good? OK, I guess we're all good. Thanks, Mike. So. Um, I realize that that's a lot of new material on partnerships. Uh, it's an attempt to reflect what we had so far. Um, there's so many kinds of terms with similar names that I'm sure that uh, when you get a chance to look at the diagrams, you'll see uh, a few errors or a few uh, gaps that are thrown up by the logic that we've got so far. So based on that, I believe we're now in a position to take a first look at some hierarchies of control and some hierarchies of ownership. So what I've done here, if you look at the um, miniature over on the on the bottom right here, you'll see that this is simply a copy of the uh, simple taxonomy diagram we were just looking at with the different taxonomy of kinds of entity and and uh, and so on. Uh, and then off to the to the right of that, I've created a hierarchy of controlling parties and the different capacities that those things have. Um, let me just quickly look at the capacities first. I've brought together several Mike, things sorry, in different it's diagrams. Yeah. Mike? It's, it's Chris yeah. Taggart. Sorry, I just had a very quick ah. question. I was, I was yeah, muted. Great. I couldn't speak before. Okay. Um, yep. Just because just i have um looking at this again for the first time for a few mm. months and so on, and it's changed a little bit since then. Um, is there anything uh, to is there anything at the moment that says um, partnerships and uh, what you know um, uh, and, and shareholding entities are mutually mm -hmm. exclusive? Ah, uh, yes, I believe so. I, I believe because I've come well. across I've come across examples where they're not where where there are company structures that have both essentially. Mm. 
called Common Diet. Oh, that is interesting. That yeah. is interesting. Okay. Yeah. This is a good chance to dive into another little piece that I um, need a bit of help with, I think. Um, so, something we mentioned um, fairly recently, not in, not in the last call, but in one of the ones before that. We had a um, limited company and we had a company incorporated by guarantee. And then under partnerships we had um, incorporated and non-incorporated. We've replaced the partnership one with all these different facets that we saw last time, but implicit in that, and there's another facet that I haven't added that would really complicate the diagram, but that is that regardless of whether, you know, at least if there are limited companies and if it's um, a, a, a incorporated partnership, and, and mostly if it's limited partners, I believe it is, but there was one example somebody gave, this may be wrong, where you can have limited partners and not be a... Uh, a, a, a body corporate, but where I'm going with this is, let's take the simple example of the partnership with only limited partners, there are no general partners to pass liability through to, the entity itself clearly carries its own liability, it is a body corporate. Now all of that is non-mutually exclusive with whether the partnership is incorporated by equity or by guarantee. So in fact, I've added this new thing here, body incorporated by equity, and I've renamed company incorporated by guarantee, which we haven't really done anything with, to body incorporated by guarantee. The thinking behind this is that to create any kind of artificial legal person, other than by statute or by royal decree or you know, um, royal charter, um, anything that's incorporated is either incorporated by equity or by guarantee. When we talked about partnerships last time, all the things that were said about limited partners were equally true whether or not those limited partners were limited by equity or by guarantee. So there's a whole set of intersection subclasses to be added here. I didn't want to clutter the diagram by attempting it now, but basically each of these kinds of partnerships may itself be, if it's incorporated, may be incorporated by guarantee or by equity. And of course companies may be incorporated by equity or by guarantee. Um, I presume there's some distinction that I've yet to find the nature of between a company incorporated by a guarantee and a partnership incorporated by a guarantee. Because some of the things we call partnerships don't have general partners and I'm puzzled as to what distinguishes them from a company incorporated by a guarantee in the case of having a lot of limited partners with, with their liability limited, limited by some guarantee instrument. There's a lot more I need to know there. But basically, to your question, um, we now have this Basic, in fact, these should be mutually exclusive. Thank you. Um, this basic mutual exclusivity between, um, actually, before I put that in, this is to your point. Um, being incorporated by equity and being incorporated by guarantee are obviously two mutually exclusive things. But yep. can a body be incorporated by a mixture of equity and guarantee or not? Well, well, yeah, that's that's exactly the case when you've got a mixture of general partners and limited partners. Right. Limited the general partners having unlimited liability. Yeah. Are in yeah, effect that, mm -hmm. bound by the guarantee. Yeah. Oh. But it's, again, it's jurisdictional. We there's a massive rat hole here in that yeah. there are a million possible variations on this if you look around the world. So let me just double check something there because I've kept wide blue sky so far between the idea of partnerships and general partners which you see are not this blue colour for legal person because the legal personhood doesn't reside in the partnership. Any liability is passed through to the partners. That's surely distinct from a body incorporated by the issuance of guarantees, is it not? Are we not talking about two different things? Um, in a partnership, well, in the can't, can't speak for the world, but in in the UK, in a normal partnership, mm -hmm. where where you only yep. have general partners with unlimited liability jointly and severally, that's yep. not an incorporated body. Agreed. That's that's universal. Yes, as far as I know. Um, okay. So that's therefore not what we're talking about in this blue box here of body incorporated by guarantee. Now I know very little about these, but I know they exist. That oh yeah, 
being able to incorporate something by issuing equity instruments like shares, there is also a mechanism where you can incorporate something by the issuance of guarantees. Now, I've never seen one. I don't know how common they are, but um, they're out there and they're bodies corporate. Oh, there's plenty of them, even in the UK. Ah, good. But that's nothing to do with partnerships with uh, limited uh, with general partners because there the general partners carry their own liability. Uh, it is you know the, the, the liability doesn't reside in the body itself. It, it passes through jointly and severally to the general partners as, as we established last time. So that does raise the question of these mysterious. Does anybody have any examples of a body corporate, a formal legal person that is incorporated by the issuance of guarantees. My understanding is there can be partnerships incorporated this way and there can be possibly things that are not partnerships incorporated this way, companies incorporated by guarantees. Um, has anybody seen one? Just bear with me while you keep on yeah. talking, I'll have a look for them. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, good. So, yeah. Okay. I posted in the um, in the questions bit um, oh. an example of the of the Luxembourg. Uh, well, there's a, a couple of uh, oh, jurisdictions yeah. across the here. Oh yeah, on commandite par action. Yeah. Um, um, any other, uh, and it seems to exist in, in in a few other jurisdictions where you basically have a, oh. um, a general partners and you also have. Um, uh, e e equity partners as well, so equity, um, equity uh, in the company as well, shareholding in the company as well. And that Sorry, is an Mike. incorporated body. Yeah. Sorry, Mike, were you, were you asking for an example of an incorporated private company limited by guarantee? Yep. Okay. I don't necessarily need to find them now, but I'm just making sure that, you know, sometimes we... we, we, we well, okay, here's one, Nominex. Oh, oh good. London good. Inter Link. Fantastic. Those are the guys that issue the IP numbers. Yeah. Lovely. So I can have a look at them. Um, yeah, and, and actually many of the uh, UK charities that are um, uh, registered yeah. companies are, are, are limited by mm -hmm. guarantee as well. Yeah, oh, Network Rail, Mike. Ah, I thought Network Rail was a kind of partnership, didn't we find that last time? It's... No, Net Network Rail is a private company limited by guarantee. Good, good, fantastic, thank you. Network Rail Limited is its full name. It's a statutory corporation, oh. creating not for yep. dividend private yep. company limited by guarantee. Good, good. So these do exist, so that's good to know. It um, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, good, and so we won't add a mutually exclusive relationship between them. And then under here, uh, so that's a body incorporated by guarantee, you've got a company incorporated by guarantee of which these examples, and of course um, we saw last time in partnerships that where the partnership has uh, legal personhood, uh, that's independent of whether the limited partners are limited by uh, equity holding or by guarantee. So these two mechanisms here, um, there's a sort of in, a set of intersections that I haven't put in below these between these being companies and these being partnerships, i.e. partnerships can take both of these forms and entities that are not partnerships that are bodies corporate, i.e. companies like our old friend the incorporated company. Um, they're also, as you see, with Normanet and Network Rail and so on, companies incorporated by guarantee. Um, that are not partnerships and partnerships incorporated by guarantee that are. Yeah. So that's all good. Thank you. Good. So, uh, so you see how we're, we've, although the names have got a bit longer and a bit more self descriptive, we've started to, the things that we've picked up in notes over the last few weeks, we've started to put them in boxes and say, well, this is the, the nature of this thing. And if some jurisdiction has some other thing of a different nature, we can start to describe it. But these are the basic concepts that we know of. Um, and so there's a lot more, it, almost any intersection of any, any several of these will define one or another kind of partnership or one or another kind of company as we saw. So, um, fantastic. Um, so with that in mind, um, 
I also wonder whether some of these statutory bodies and so on are in fact uh, bodies corporate, i.e. formal organisations or, or, or not, but that's, that's for another time. Um, so then for all these kinds of things that we talked about and the kinds of entities that exist in relation to these, uh, we talked about um, organisation members, we saw that partnership uh, partners were kinds of organisation member. Um, there are also kinds of controlling party and there are also kinds of owner. So what we've done here is taken that same basic taxonomy of kinds of thing and then for the control one, we looked at this last time very briefly, but we have these basic concepts of de jure control and de facto control. And we also talked briefly about managerial control, I haven't done much with that yet. Um, earlier on in the model we also had a whole range of legal capacities. Um, above all this I've got what's called a legal construct, I've, this has changed its name a few times now, but basically anything that's conferred by a logical union of law, contract and constitution. In other words, it's something conferred by law or by contract or by uh, some constitutional uh, arrangement. So that would in include you know, rights and obligations and so on, um, but also uh, in terms of control, the jury control, that's control that has some legal standing, uh, but also legal capacities. We talked at the beginning of these reviews about signatory capacities, the ability of something to, ah, oh, I just see another question coming up, I'll just come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, so we talked about how things can sign contracts on behalf of other things. Um, also last time we had a concept called legal control which we had linked to executives and things. We said no that's wrong, executives don't have legal control. So I reread the definition and in fact what we really meant by that all along was some delegated legal control. So there may be some commonalities in that and managerial control and that's something to, to come back to after we dealt with the simple stuff. The simple stuff is this de jure control. So before I get on to that, there's a little comment in the questions queue to see if I've missed any others first. Um, so, uh, Jacobus, Jacobus, have you got a, um, are you unmuted or, if not, I can read your uh, No, 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 I, I, ju I was just thinking, this, these limits, these inc incorporation limits that you have, like uh, by guarantee and by equity, maybe you mm -hmm. could make a separate class for that, that any corporate body could have one oh. or more of those limits? So that you can basically make a com any combination of, of limits um, that would, would be more flexible, perhaps, Ooh. than making all those subclasses. Hmm. That's an interesting point. Um, so let's just have a look at that bit of the taxonomy again. So, in order to create a separate legal person, uh, what's called a legal fiction, where you take some formal organization be it a partnership or a group of people or whatever, a group of friends, and turn them into a body corporate, their entity, the, no, the, let me get this right, the entity of, sorry, the liability of the entity is limited by the extent of one's equity if it's an equity based thing, such as shares or such as limited partner equity in the partnership, or by the extent of some kind of, and I'd love to see what these look like, some kind of guarantee in it. And I presume that instead of having a lot of shareholders who hold equity and their liability of course is limited to the extent of their equity in that if the company runs out of money the equity is worth zero. Um, versus guarantees, where presumably one creates some kind of certificate of guarantee or some kind of formal pledge or something. Um, I don't know what those look like. We can dig in between now and next time into the, the paperwork for Nominet and Network Well and find what those look like, I guess. Um, yeah, but, but does, that, does that justify making a subclass of body corporate? You, know, you could perhaps, uh, the, 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 that limit that, that a body corporate has, like a limit by equity or a limit by guarantee, could be a separate class um, and you could have a one to end relationship to that class. I'm wondering that. It's from the modeling perspective, it feels more like a facet. All these different ways in which we divide things, when they're not mutually exclusive, the different classification facets. Um, one thing some modelers do is put a class in above, say, these two, representing the facet by which these are distinguished from each other because it's separate from some of the other facets. Especially when they're not mutually exclusive, it makes it harder to see that you're looking at a single facet. 
Another approach which I tend to favour is to create a logical union so you can talk about the facet and refer to it um, in terms of the union of things that are defined according to that facet. But we're really getting into deep modelling questions here, which is probably for another time. But the legal and business question that that raises is can a body that's incorporated be incorporated by the mix of both? We've already asked that and the answer is yes. Uh, we have the Luxembourg example. How does that work? Does yeah, but the, that but mean that there's one set of other other two issues of well no, one issue of equity <laughs> and another issue of guarantees. Yeah. Um, right. But that would be a set. Huh? You would be you would have a set of guarantees and equities. Oh. Um, Indeed. So you would have to have to res register any of those. Uh, explicit guarantees anyway, so that's yeah. yeah. Now what I haven't done yet, I've done it specifically for partnerships and limited companies that have not managed to generalize yet, is the link to the equity as equity. And then similar to that then would be a link to the set of guarantees. I hope I heard some 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 yeses in the background there. Um, and the link to the limited partners as well. Yes. But and and would would that not would, could we not make a, an abstract class above those three uh, concepts uh, called limit or something or corporation limit? Um, very good point. How does that link to the accounting stuff? So so in other words, when you add together in the case of both the equity and the guarantees, is there a a more abstract limit? That is essentially, correct me if I get this wrong, the sum of the extent of the equity and the extent of the guarantee. That's the question, right? Yes. Excellent. Um, that would make a lot of sense from a modeling point of view. And yeah, I sort of, I just added these two in as a facet. And one of the things I think we can take coming out of this session is to take some of the mechanisms I have currently under incorporated company. Uh, well, in fact, I'll tell you what, let's go straight from the control model we're in now to the ownership model, because actually this has some of these mechanisms. And you'll see what I mean, where we can generalize that stuff. We have the concept of equity, which comes straight out of the accounting model and the uh, accounts equation that links assets, liabilities, uh, debt, and equity. And typically under that, if you look in a limited company, under equity, you have stockholder equity and you have additional paid in capital and owner's equity and so on. So stockholder equity has been there all along and is referred to, as you can see, by these, these long lines at the bottom here, from limited company. Some or all of this should probably be at that more abstract level of anything that's incorporated by equity and it would then automatically apply to um, both limited companies and partnerships. Yeah, you should have some kind of link class uh, uh, that links mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, when an equity is used as a limit uh, for incorporating a, uh, a company, then you need some class that links the two, the, the yeah. body corporate and the equity. Because you need to know, because there are some other attributes there, you need to know what the limit exactly is. Yeah. Well, the limit is the extent of the equity itself, isn't it? Yes. And, uh, but maybe there are dates and 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 percentages and etc. Um, yep. That certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, and this is, I mean, you've really gone to the heart of what I'm trying to do here, which is take things that we've identified for simple things like limited companies. You see all these lines going from limited companies to all these share and equity related terms and say, well, most of these should apply to the level of this new, more general class here. And then when you have a partnership incorporated by equity, the same sort of things apply to that. And then this stockholder equity would become perhaps a parent or ancestor to this limited partner equity. At the moment, I have these in two completely different silos. And it's this kind of generality that we need to uh, unpick. So basically, this is just is a direct reflection of what we discussed last time. On the ownership side, we looked at control just now very briefly, but let's start with ownership. 
you have uh, an owning party, which was already in the model without any formal terms around it, I've put well, an owning party in this sense, which doesn't just mean anything that owns anything, so owning shares and so on, that is a separate term, but an owning party, something that holds some equity in something that of necessity has equity, and in fact this line over here, what is equity, it represents an interest in, there's a property called represents an interest in, some formal organisation, and of course that is ancestral to all our bodies, corporate and our partnerships and so on. So all equity is, and this will be true of funds as well, particular kinds of funds that uh, have equity uh, share units, that also needs to go into this kind of generalisation. Um, then under partnerships, and this is where we wanted to take it away from just limited companies and start this process of abstracting upwards, we have partners in general which hold some kind of partnership e equity of some sort. The only sorts of partnership equity you actually find are general partner equity and limited partner equity. Now, I haven't created an explicit link between the general partner equity and the uh, liability that goes with that. That's something I'd like to think about. But uh, we have the general partner. If a partnership has a general partner, the general partner holds, holds the general partner equity, as we talked about. A limited partner holds limited partner equity. And now we can start to add some facts around those. But I think that, um, well, there was an interesting point there. We said that what was said about limited partners was true, whether those limited partners um, are based on equity or on guarantees. So perhaps this is too specific. We're talking about equity limited partners. What about limited partners in a partnership that is incorporated by the issuance of guarantees? Those do exist, I'm told. The partners that are not general partners are still called limited partners. Presumably they don't hold limited partner equity, and presumably this really belongs to the equity subset of that. So that's, you know, having put on the page what we noted last time, that's the kind of question that starts to ask itself. Um, Mike. Yeah. Sorry, a couple of comments from Richie Barter on the uh, oh. on questions. I don't know whether Fantastic. you can pick those up. Yep. Hi, Richie. Yeah. You're live. You're on air. Richie. Hey, good afternoon. There you are. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I was just two things that occurred to me as you were talking there. One was on um, it, when, mm. where you were talking about the case of having both equity and a set of guarantees um, in the issuance of the, uh, of the corporation and the company. I guess to me, to my mind, in the case of defaults, uh, which of the two parties would incur losses first? Is that kind of something that's set in stone? Is it a case by case basis? Um, you know, would the equity holders take the loss first and then, and then the, the guarantor? That's something to consider. And the other thing that occurred to me was. I think, if I remember correctly, I have seen cases in a senior sub-model within a corporation where um, private companies incorporated by equity, but there is a side mm -hmm. letter, a guarantee on the side. Um, oh. where now, it's kind of in the back of my mind something that just kind of occurred to me that I think I've seen that, but I, I it wasn't able ah. to find it online when I did it yet. Well, uh, there's a very good. I'll give you a very simple example of that. Uh, it's almost trivial, but it's maybe what you're talking about. Um, take a small limited company like a typical consultant vehicle or contractor vehicle where you have what the banks call a closed company, although that's really an internal uh, definition, which is like you know, you've got one director who basically does all the work and for legal reasons there's one other shareholder somewhere, um, but basically it's just a person. And the bank won't lend money to that entity without first getting the director or somebody to put some guarantees in place. So and that, is that what you mean by the side letter? So you know, yeah, to example, me, but I, the, my experience of it, it's been done at a, a kind of an, uh, like a large corporate where you'd have a an issuance oh. vehicle within the total structure of the corporation. Um, in, oh in right, so it's not only to... small vehicles that do that then. Yeah, but hang on, um, you talk, those are guarantee those are guarantees to underwrite lines underwrite lines of credit and stuff like that. They're not sort yeah. of guarantees to do with the constitution of a corporate entity. Yeah, but they're not the same good, thing. Yeah. Because you guarantee no. it in order to protect against. Well, I, I come at it from a loss base concept. Wow. Oh, well, here's the difference. Yeah, go on, Phil. So those, those are the sort of guarantees, like when I write a guarantee for my daughter to the person who she's renting a flat from, to say if she doesn't pay her rent, yeah. then I'll pay it for her. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah. that's a different kind it's, of guarantee. It's, it's to a, a specific, it's to a specific lender, and it's not fungible. So 
it doesn't affect the structure of the company on unwinding or anything like that because it's not a guarantee yeah. to all potential debtors of the company. It's a guarantee to one specific debtor. Well, it might affect it. On, it might affect on liquidation, depending on the seniority of the you know yes. of, of the debt. But yes. but I do I think the I think the point is is that the is that it's not part of the constitutional part of the of the, of the yes. company and of the legal structure. It's something that is contractually issued, um, you know, uh, separate from the formation and legal structure. So it's not embedded in either in the um, uh, overriding law which allows the company to be to be formed, nor is it, uh, you know, in the um, articles of association or, or, or you know. Correct. Correct, but there still is a guarantor. There still is a guarantee somewhere, either on a specific obligation or on general obligations, which is worth considering. That, that would guess that was my point. Mm. Well, it's worth considering from the point of view of networks of, of, of risk and and so yeah. on and exposure and all of that. But it is not. I think you hit on the key word just now: constitutional. In fact, you'd be interested to know that in our model of what it means to be a body corporate, um, that is one of the relationships is that it has a link to some kind of uh, constitutional document, and uh, because we try and do everything by way of generalizations and abstractions, the parent of that is actually constitution. It's the same kind of thing as a national constitution. But it's the constitution of um, a uh, a body corporate. So, so again, the, the the language is no coincidence there in terms of uh, um, the 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 the, uh, the body is constituted and it has a document which sets out exactly how it's constituted. And what its constitution is, and that is subtly but importantly different from the formal agreement among the principles that defines a formal organisation. So a typical uh, limited company would have both a director's agreement among the principles because it's a formal organisation, and a memorandum and articles, which are the constitutional documents set out in the relevant body of company law that essentially define its very constitution. I mean, again the the yeah. language is full of little clues like that. <laughs> mm. Good, good. So, uh, on the equity front then, I, I take Gregor's point, I think that having introduced this simple dichotomy of all bodies corporate are either incorporated by equity or by guarantee, we should be able to take what was stockholder equity for limited companies and what is limited partner equity for partnerships where the limited partner is limited by the issuance of equity and presumably there are limited partners which are not. Um, this is one of the questions that asks itself. And then that equity, those two kinds of equity can be related to each other and to a more general uh, concept of, of, of equity in in some body corporate, right? So whereas we said at the beginning of our partnership review last time, well limited partners are limited partner equity, we also said that it's still a limited partner if it's incorporated by guarantee and not equity. So I infer from that that the model as it stands is subtly wrong because in that case, the limited partner doesn't have a limited partner equity. Am I yeah, right get, in thinking that? Mike, Mike, can I just clarify? Did, did, were you just implying that the, with, for a company limited by guarantee, the, the value of the guarantees are not equity, which is correct? They're not. Right. They, don't, they don't appear on the balance sheet as part of the net worth of the company. Right. Good. Usually, they're just nominal amounts anyway. Network Rail, for example. Ah. They don't appear on the balance sheet as anything, do they? No, it's, no, because it's it's not real. It's intangible. It's off balance sheet. It's right. contingent liability or contingent asset, really. Oh, right. Depends how you look at it. Yeah. Oh, because the guarantee is meaningless unless the company goes into some form of um, liquidation or default event. Mm. So then it's a contingent liability to the entity and a contingent asset to the individuals that, uh, that yes, right. issued that guarantee. Mm. Uh, 
and presumably the kinds of individuals that can, uh, I don't know if issuing is the right word, I've just used it there, tell me if it's wrong, but the individuals that have issued the guarantees or created the guarantees or signed them or whatever, um, can themselves be any kind of um, I need to put this in there. any kind of legal person. They don't just have to be human beings. They don't have to not be human beings. Oh, no, any, any, anything can issue a guarantee, can be a signatory to a guarantee. Any, ah, legal, when you say any legal body. Any legal body. So not, for example, a trust or a non-incorporated partnership. You wouldn't want that issuing a guarantee, or would you? Can that still be, as a potential signatory, sign such a guarantee and then the... No, it, it, it's law of, it depends on the law of contract in the jurisdiction, but anything that can be, as, as per usual, anything that can be sued in a court of law for breach of contract can be oh. signatory to contract, <laughs> by definition. Right, thank you, that answers my question perfectly, so, because you know where I'm going next, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting to know you too well, mate. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so these have a similar sort of position in relation to the entity as the shareholder would have with a um, company, but let me just, let me just uh, fill this in, stay with me for a moment, and then you'll see um, we have any partnership, any partner has an identity relationship, the identity of this is that it can be, oh it's not on here, uh, be any potential partner. Let me just find that. Which was a mix of both formal and informal organizations. Oh no, wait, no, is any no, is any any contract any uh, what's the word? Um, uh, contractually capable. Uh, it is on here. There we go. Contractually capable entity, that's the fellow I'm looking for. Right, so Entity. It can't be, for example, a married couple or a, a crime syndicate or something like that, but it can be a guarantor identity. It can be a fellow over here. I'm just going to spin that so it becomes a little easier to see. And I'm just going to try to put in the same names on the relationship in the boxes for future tidiness. Fantastic. So that was what I was hinting at. I've done it. Good. Um, so then these, uh, we can then, so this isn't true of all limited partners. It's true of limited partners that are themselves guarantors. So that uh, we can even put that in actually. Um, Mike, yeah, while you're there, part, right, yeah. Mike, sorry, I've just yeah. realised that also Chris Barry has posted a couple of uh, comments. He is oh, not good. with audio, so if you'd like to okay. read those out. Sure thing. Let me just, uh, just put this other fellow in here. Uh, guarantee limited partner. Feel free to undo this later, but you see where I'm going with this. Probably with what we put on last time, we can now uh, we find these and we can correct this so that limited partner equity is held only by oops, no, wrong one, the equity limited partner and suddenly that error is no longer an error. Right, now, uh, Chris Berry, uh, you say you don't have a microphone, is that, is that right? Um, the guarantee can also have a valuation associated with it. Pledge machinery and equipment or real estate, the valuation of pledge assets can provide favored pricing. Valuations are not just in terms of default. Cool, right. Uh, I'm going to Thank you. 
I, I'll just, um, as you probably noticed from my notes last time, I tend to go through, pick out the verbatim notes, and then go through again and try and boil it down into meaningful stuff. And then eventually I'll put them up on the site. Um, so I would include that comment in detail. But basically, the point is that uh, the guarantee has evaluation associated with it. Um, not sure how to model but, that. Yeah, but those are the that. non constitutional guarantees. Ah, oh, ah, is that right? Like the guarantees that underwrite loans and other things. They, they have value. Does... You have to value those when working out your credit risk exposure. Yes. So is it the case that for the kinds of guarantees that the body corporate is incorporated by, Chris's comment doesn't apply? Chris is saying correct. You are correct in in the uh, in the chat box. So I'll take that as a yes. Uh, right. Good. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that. Cool. Okay. Thanks. That's, yeah. So there is a, a broader model elsewhere on on guarantee and collateral. Uh, sorry, I just did some weird thing by mistake there. Um, um, based on the Working Group 11 work from years ago on guarantees and collaterals for the debts and things. Um, we'll pick that up when we come to the debt part of the uh, securities model. Um, there's quite a lot in there. There's negative pledge and um, all sorts of weird things. So um, we'll have a chance to look at that when we start looking at the security terms. Good. Um, right. So I've, I've fixed the mistake whereby everything we said about limited partners last time we were actually saying about limited partners that have equity. So now we have. Um, and I'll take from that then that actually a guarantee limited partner, for want of a better word, and that's the thing, an equity limited partner, isn't actually a kind of owner. Would that be correct? Sorry, what was that, Mike? Sorry. So we talked about limited partners last time. We talked about limited partner equity, and I've just fixed this thing such that the limited partner equity is only held by what I've labelled, for want of a better word, an equity limited partner. And if it's a partnership incorporated by guarantee, then you have a limited partner that doesn't have a limited partner equity. And again, for want of a better word, I've called it a guarantee limited partner. It, the question sorry, you, then arises. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mike, hang on, hang on. Are you talking about private companies limited by guarantee or partnerships limited by guarantee because it's different? Right. Ah, I'm talking here about partnerships. But I'd be interested to know about that difference. Well, private private companies limited by guarantee don't don't have shareholders, obviously because they right. don't have any shares. They have what are called members instead. Right. And the members, except in that Luxembourg example where we saw they were both. But in general, in general, they have members, and the members are quote unquote the owners. Yes. As opposed ah. to a normal co limited company or incorporated company where they have shares, and the shareholders are the owners. Right. In a partnership, yeah. uh, limited guarantee, then the part you have partners rather than shareholders or members, and yeah. the partners are the owners of the company. Generally speaking. Right, which answers my question. Good, um, and also answers the. The future question of how to uh, add in these kind of Venn diagram intersections between the body incorporated by guarantee that's a company and the body incorporated by guarantee that's a partnership and what the names of the different partners are. So this guarantor in the case of a company is simply called a member. Um, so that's good. Put that in. Um, we'll probably need to give it a longer name eventually, but we'll call it member for now. Um, and then um, blah, 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 blah. the question then about ownership is an interesting one because we took ownership, we said last time, is synonymous with equity. And a normal partnership, a non-incorporated partnership that only has general partners, only has general partner e equity. And the general partners hold all the equity in the partnership. Where there's a limited partner, then there is limited partner equity. But clearly, uh, if the partnership is incorporated by guarantees rather than equity, I'm assuming there isn't. But then, what does it mean to own? If you're 
a limited partner in a partnership that is incorporated and is incorporated by the issuance of guarantees and not by the issuance of equities, what do you actually owe? Pretty much. Is there still a kind of equity that you hold? Uh, we said last time that equity and ownership are effectively synonymous. Is what? that still Mike. Mike. <laughs> Yes. Which type of company are you talking about again? Sorry. Here I'm talking about partnerships. partnerships which, which type of partnerships? Partnerships that are legally incorporated and specifically partnerships that are legally incorporated by the issuance of guarantees rather than by the issuance of equity. Uh, okay, so so if it's a partnership, mm -hmm. then the partners mm -hmm. have an equity stake in the business. So they yeah. are the owners of it. So that's the case with the general partners that have the general equity in the business, and indeed all partners have a all partners. Mate, all partners have some equity. It's, it's usually the case the general partner has general partner or partners have most of the equity for obvious reasons. Yep. Yep. And that's the general partner equity that we talked about last time. Yep. And then we said limited partners have limited partner equity. And the question I'm now asking is what about if the entity isn't um, isn't incorporated by equity, but is incorporated by guarantees instead. Do the limited partners then hold a share in the overall equity, or do they still hold limited partner equity, but with some different kind of limited partner equity, or what? Hang on. If it's a, is it? Are we talking about a partnership limited by guarantee? Right. Or a. a it's no, it's no different. They, they, the partnership, a partnership limited by guarantee. Mm -hmm. The part, whoever they are, still effectively own the equity of the business. Right. In a partnership going to limited by guarantee, are there still limited partners at all, or is that? Constant? Well, they may or may not be. Two different sorts right. of companies. There's one way you can have a mixture, right. and one way you can't. Right. Good. So, where there are limited partners in a partnership incorporated by the issuance of guarantees, rather than incorporated by the issuance of equity. What sort of equity does a limited partner hold? It's stated in their partnership agreement, ah. which is a, which is a written contract between themselves and the other partners. So it could be any of the above. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Think about the classic case where you have a business with a sleeping partner. Yep. Who puts some quote unquote some money into a business but takes no active part mm -hmm. in running it? Mm -hmm. They're basically just an investor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so if I put ten thousand pounds into my friend's partnership, mm -hmm. yeah, and he makes me a limited partner, yeah, I've got I've yeah. got ten grand's worth of equity in that business. Right. But I'm just, but effectively, I'm just an investor. But but legally, I'm a. He can make me a limited partner. And you, you can be a limited partner, without being a holder of the additional equity that was created for a partnership that is incorporated by the issuance of equity. I thought we were talking about the guarantee limited partnerships. We are. Well, there's no equity in a guarantee limited partnership. There's no issue. Sorry, there's no issue of equity in a guarantee limited partnership. Yeah, exactly. Nothing issue. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Whereas with one with equity, there is, and one without, well, there isn't. And this is the point. This over here, this limited partner equity, is the equity that is issued, I think, in creating a company issued by, sorry, a partnership incorporated by the issuance of equity. Therefore, my assumption was this can't be what's, it can't exist, as you just said, in a partnership incorporated by the issuance of guarantees. So right. then presumably only general partnership equity only general equity like partnership equity and it's not distinguished, it's not divided into different kinds. Is that is that correct? I I, I think so. Good. Getting a bit In which confused. case the limited partner doesn't have any relationship to any extra classes of equity. They are still a limited partner, their liability is limited, and they are still by virtue of being a partnership somebody could hold equity in some equity in the partnership, whereas in a partnership incorporated by the issuance of equity, you have limited partners 
that specifically hold additional equity that was created by the general partners for the limited partners. As I think, Mike, I, I think we need to mm -hmm. distinguish between con what I would call constitutional equity versus, mm -hmm. in versus investment equity. Ooh. Ah, go on. Well, constitutional equity. That is that defined in the constitution of the company. So, um, mm -hmm. whereas investor investment equity obviously is, if I is my example where I injected ten thousand pounds into a partnership, but they didn't make me a partner. Mm. Yeah, I'm just I'm basically just lent them some money. I'm an investor. Yeah? Mm. And I might have a legal document drawn up that says I've invested ten thousand pounds into this company, and, and that money is protected under certain circumstances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not a partnership agreement. It's a yeah, exactly. agreement between the partnership and the uh, investor. Yeah. yeah. So there might be a, might be a document drawn up that says if the partnership is folded for any reason, I get my ten thousand pounds back. Yep. And that's not constitutional. Yep. No, absolutely not. So far, I think we're still in the same place. We're still on the same page. So I hope we are. Yeah, I'm just kind of unpicking the inexorable logic of laying these things down on the page and seeing if there are holes. Yeah. But given that, then the case where you have a limited partner and the entity is incorporated by the issuance of some additional partner equity, which is the limited partner equity, this relationship holds. In the case where it isn't, you this inherited relationship of having some kind of equity and the details I would have described in the partnership agreement holds. In both cases, the general partner has general partner equity anyway. If it's a general partner, there is that general partner equity. So my original question was whether this inheritance line here where the limited partner is a kind of owner is correct and everything I'm hearing says that it is. Yeah. Great. That's what I wanted to say. Limited partner is a constitutional owner. Yep. Good. Same as a general partner is. Good. And it's only in the case of where it's issued with equity that the limited partner specifically owns limited partner equity. Does that always apply? Or? Okay. Sorry, Mike, could you repeat the question? Sorry. So, where there is limited partner equity, that's only in the case where it's a partnership issued by, um, uh, sorry, partnership incorporated by the issuance of equity. But in either case, yes, the limited partner is a constitutional owner. Fantastic. That's what I was after. Yeah. Okay. The reason, what the reason earlier why I mentioned the concept of a sleeping partner, which I'm sure you're familiar mm. with. Is because yep. in, in some ways that term was invented to describe exactly the situation where you, we have a, a effective, what's effectively a partner who has some degree of control and influence over a business, but legally it doesn't appear to be part of the partnership. Ah. So it's like a behind the scenes, you know, owner, if you like. Oh, right. Because it's a bilateral agreement with them, where they've invested something. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, if you if you if you put if you put a million pounds into a business, you'd want to have some degree of influence over it, wouldn't you? Mm. Mm, yes, you would. <laughs> so even though legally you you wouldn't appear on legal documents as a partner because you aren't one legally. Yeah. Yeah, so this all plays into that whole de facto control thing. Mm, yes, indeed. Ah. You know, you, you go beyond being a mere investor into being an influential investor. Right. So in that case, I wonder, can we, uh, if we go back to the control part, of this, I'm just going to pop that little note in there and train of notes there, right, so then in the control side of things, so that was ownership, of course much ownership comes with control, what I haven't really tried to do yet is connect together classes of equity with kinds of control, that may be a bit ambitious but we may want to think about that, so now as de facto controlling party, an example of that would be a sleeping partner, I'm sure there are many other examples as well. Well yeah, any, 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 <laughs> 
any major investor in any type of company may may be in a position to exert de facto control. Right. Or may have some degree of de facto control, depends on the yeah. situation. Now, whether we could model that in any formal way is another matter, but it's very easy we can name it and define it. So that's, uh, in fact, we can start to put a definition in there. Uh, let's put that note in as the definition in here. And put the other note in as a further example. De facto controlling party. Further notes. Bingo. Okay. As I say, I don't think that's ever going to be necessarily measurable, but it's certainly assertable. You can say, right, you know, I have some data that says that I believe that Company A has some de facto control of Company B, and I can back it up in writing with reference to this shareholding well, they have, but, but I can't necessarily formalize it in uh, something that's well, firm uh, enough uh, for data feed, but it doesn't stop it being meaningful. A, a brief analysis of the balance sheet of a company will reveal the truth ah. or should you. Yeah? Because where you have loans, loans from other companies, including banks. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Well, it, so it may be it may be um, uh, divinable by the outside, but it also may be reportable. So you know, there's uh, in the the U.S. Um, structure, there's a, a concept of, of of control, and that's a and control. You know, so th that's a where they have to uh, where companies have to report their controlling interests, and uh, you know, and that can be through multiple routes. You know, ten percent here, five percent here, and so on. So one of the reasons why it's useful to be able to do that, have, have this, is that this information that is being currently reported needs a way of being expressed as, as data. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So the de facto control term is in play in reporting, uh, systemic analysis, etc. Yeah, I'll post. I'll post a link in a second. I'll just try and dig it out. Mm. And it may be that it's easier to formalise than I thought, or at least if it's asserted in reports, and that's independent of being able to measure the de jure control of somebody owning fifty percent plus one of the voting shares in the company. Yeah. But over and above that. This is something I've been wondering about. I saw some conversations recently on one of these forums about uh, some kind of account-based assertion of control, and I was wondering whether that was itself um, included in the, uh, uh, you know, whether it was simply another reflection of, of de jure shareholding control or whether there was something else. And it sounds like the same. It includes. Yeah. So, so Mike, I've just other, pasted other. in as, as, as the questions mm. a, a link to the. Um, ECFR, which is the the U.S. Um, financial um, definite federal financial definitions, um, and there's a definitions thing, and then if you go to uh, uh, it should uh, jump you to a bookmark, and then there's a G is control, and it says the term control brackets including the terms controlling, controlled by, and under common control with close brackets mm -hmm. means the possession, mm -hmm. direct or indirect, of the power to direct or cause the direction of the management and policies of a person, whether through the ownership of voting shares by contract or by or otherwise. Ah, good. I can't so, so obviously on, the, this on the link, but as soon as I get it out of here and into the spreadsheet, I'll be able to click on that link as well. Yeah, so 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 obviously this is US, so that doesn't necessarily mean that other jurisdictions would consider control to be exactly the same, or, or even report it, 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 you know, the same. But nevertheless, it's a it's a useful starting point, I think. Well, if it's formal enough for us to specify, then it's a matter of whether other jurisdictions also report the things so specified. If it's too detailed, or maybe the two or three facets that are combined, then maybe we just pick the ones that look as though. Yeah, yeah. My, my 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 thought was is that it might be you know, and I don't know about this, but it could it, you know it mm. could be that another one would say um, uh, that control had to be through voting shares or contracts, but not otherwise or something. You know, was oh. the, well, say, if another one said, yeah, I do. Now, if another one said that, we go, ah, uh -huh. you mean this? 
to the jury control thank you we've already got it <laughs> yeah absolutely so, so in other so words I, you could have people reporting de facto control you have already de jure control which is easily deductible you're either a general partner or you're a voting shareholder which is somebody yeah. else with a voting share which carries voting rights yada 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 um, parent and part owner of all kinds of voting shareholding company we think um, that's another question but um, so the de jure is already there. Um, I guess part of what we were trying to do is flesh out the non de jure, the de facto. Yeah, absolutely. That may yeah. simply be self-asserted, or there may be other detectable parameters. In which case, we can subclass these according to different detectable parameters, but also just stay at this level here. You know, just asserted, um, or maybe something. Well, the, 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 the only thing I would say about the de jure one is that is that the mm -hmm. de, de jure one might not be detectable. You know, if it goes through multiples, you know, if it goes if it earns ten percent through five, you know, and sorry, sixty percent through six different, you know, secrecy jurisdictions, you know, essentially through different types of things, it's not necessarily detectable, but it is reportable. Oh, so the de jure may not just be detectable. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, nominee can Yeah. Right. You know, and it, and, and I think the the thing about the, this this definition of control is it says we don't really care how it's how it's how it's control how how the mechanism is or even how many chains it goes through. If you control mm -hmm. it, you've got to tell us essentially. Yeah. Right. So there's a kind of don't care control. The, 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 there's a. <laughs> There's a the obligation is on you to do it, and that now obviously people, you know, there's a question of will you get caught, but the the yeah. the point is is that the the you have a, an obligation to report, you know, or, or at least this is the this this document is about definitions rather than telling you what you must or must not report. But if someone else says you must report when you control this or who you are, you know, um, uh, these entities that you control, then. Then it comes back to this, and and it's basically saying we don't really care whether you're going through you know uh, ten different intermediate companies um, or um, and with with multiple links in the chain and and nominee companies and anything else. It's just this is what control is. So I, I what what I would say is is that the juro is it, it, it's about you know um, uh, it isn't necessarily visible, but um, uh, uh, because it depends on what information is made is made public and, and on mm. what you know, as you said, nominees, all sorts of you know side agreements and things like that. And, and this includes obviously contractual as well, um, uh, which uh -huh. is which is quite important. Uh, so, so some of the types of webs of influence he talks about before, or possibly existence of guarantees, other contractual instruments may also be. Yeah, well, not just a question of guarantees, but it's a, well, yes, there's guarantees because essentially you could you could use a guarantee, but also, you know, one of the things that you could do is to have a uh, a, a contractual relationship with another com uh, company of which you have zero equity in it, and that contract basically says everything they do they do for you. <laughs> um, so, right. so, so the the again, it's not. Stating what type of contract it is, or what whether it's to do with guarantees or anything else, but um, you know, this is something we've been discussing the Financial Stability Board, you yeah. know, a little bit in terms of what those what those potential things are, are going to 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 look like. Whether they all, you know, whether do they do they already exist, and and, and are we um, are, are they likely to exist in the future? Mm. So to that end, we have a a very uh, Interesting and detailed comment from Amanda Visedom. Do you have voice, Amanda? Are you able to uh, speak to your comment? You have the floor, Amanda. Okay, she may be without voice. Uh, so it says the, this pattern now being described, i.e., evidence of control by others than partners, etc., can be formalised as a set of patterns. And one, therefore, could be detected in reasoning over known data, and two, could be used to detect compliance or reporting anomalies, and three, the existence of extra constitutional or de facto control, if I'm understanding correctly, could be represented as a kind of risk factor and or for used in risk detection and analysis. Um, 
I'm guessing this is in the context of semantic technology reasoners and the kinds of things you can do with those that we might be uh, not thinking about because they can't necessarily be done so easily in, in regular relational data, which is that getting all these things in place, it's then possible to detect patterns in those. Um, does that make sense, Amanda? Have you got voice yet? Or uh, expand on that comment at all? Okay, I'm going to, like all of these comments and the questions here, I'm going to include them in an annex to the notes, but I think, uh, I think that's a point worth uh, bringing forward in, 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 the, in the notes generally. So I'm just going to note down here. So what I tend to do is I kind of capture all the stuff that we've written down as we went along and try and get it in order to get some shape of the conversation. So um, I'll drop a random note in at that point. Fantastic. Um, good. So uh, that helps us flush out a little bit of the jury versus de facto. We've also flushed out a little bit of uh, different kinds of equity and how our new generalizations of um, anything incorporated by guarantee and anything incorporated by equity can be related to linking these different kinds of equity together rather more than we have now. I think, though, in general, what we've managed to do is take what were company-specific, shareholder-specific kinds of control and kinds of ownership and promote them up the path to what is the most general kind of owning, what is the most general kind of control. Uh, clearly, the most common case, the uh, voting shareholder, as you can see, is both an owner and a controlling party. And uh, likewise, so is the... Um, general partner in the partnership, um, a controlling party as well as an owning party. I'm just going to go down here. Here we go. Uh, the fact, uh, de jure controlling partner includes general partner in the partnership. Um, I'm hoping that what we did with partnerships has therefore helped us to get the right level of generality to the overall things Oh yes, good. Amanda's got back to us. Yes, she was muted. Yes, that was the idea. Worth capturing while knowledge is being elicited is the idea that it may be of use later. That's a very good point. Some of the kinds of particularly de facto and perhaps if people are asserting de facto control based on several factors, we can say what kind of factors exist. So you can say what somebody is asserting, whether or not we know that we can do anything with it now because we can then do a lot more reasoning. And also, perhaps, some of this new visual analytics type of thing, where you find different ways of setting out all these different meaningful concepts so you can actually see them in a kind of shape or something, as well as reasoning over them and uh, extracting networks of risk, uh, hierarchies of risk, um, chances of exposures, and so on. Um, yeah, exciting stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is one reason why, although here we're looking at these very very fluffy, high-level, um, businessy concepts that don't all necessarily come with data. One thing we can look at was two things. Firstly, well, there is often data that just asserts the existence of these um, rather less uh, uh, data-y concepts. But also, with many kinds of, or well, certainly with all kinds of de jure control, there will always be some kind of instrument which reflects that, which can be seen in data and can be reasoned over. So this is why we're bringing together the the formal semantics of the business concepts, the legal concepts, and the constitutional concepts, and so on, with the semantic reasoning over kinds of data. And in fact, it's a two-way street, because sometimes the data is asserting the existence of these kinds of more abstract concepts, but then you can reason over it and draw influences or create diagrams of webs of influence and so on. Um, so that's all exciting stuff. Um, good. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so basically then, we've got five minutes to go. To summarize, I think we've managed to at least partially succeed in our quest to take what were the simple relationships that we often talk about, ownership and parent and so on, which when we dig into them are really uh, owning shareholder uh, relationships in limited companies, and work out how to generalize these to other kinds of entity. There's a bit of work to do on moving some of this share ownership stuff up to all bodies incorporated by equity and fill in some of the details on guarantee and so on. But basically, as a result of that, we've defined kinds of control and kinds of equity. We've defined kinds of controlling party 
we haven't yet tried to link control and equity together and say here's the kind of equity which comes with control and here's the kind of equity that comes without control. I don't know whether that's meaningful or sensible or whether it's consistent and legally right. That's something to think about. Um, a bit of work through tidying up these generalizations, but otherwise, I think what I was after, which was to have a nice big jolly picture of all the ownership hierarchies, um, look, looks a bit messy, um, is pretty much there. And we've uh, you know, defined what kinds of entity can uh, exist in these various capacities and so on and carry out these various roles. So I think we're in a good place. Um, any any last minute thoughts or things that I should dive into and worry about before we, uh, before we sign off? We have three minutes, so plenty of time. Uh, Mike, one question: Is there is there an hmm. old version of this that we can look at in the, in the, uh, Prodigy or in an oh. old program? <laughs> okay, there's there's two there's two different answers to that. Um, Firstly, uh, well, right now, no, there isn't. But that's only because uh, I have to do a little bit of technical tightening up and cleaning out the tables and so on, which I've done a little bit of over Christmas, but not that much, in order to then hand it across to Adaptive, who then generate the owl. So there will be um, an owl version. I just wanted to get this kind of clarity we're looking at today before handing it across the, across the cubicle wall, as it were. Um, there will be an owl version of what you're basically seeing here with the little actions we identified today. I think it's in a good enough place for us to say, yep, this is good enough to take it through the, uh, the machinery that produces owl. But um, we have to be very, very careful about this. When, a lot of people, when they see something in owl, will think, well, then this is... Uh, application ready. So OWL is a strange thing. On the one hand, it gives us the set theoretic uh, ability to define everything as things and sets of things. And because of what's called the open world assumption, um, you know, it doesn't have to be things that you necessarily either know or have data for, for us to be able to make very formal, very legal assertions about things. And of course, the business meaning of most of what we're talking about is grounded in law and contracts and rights and obligations and other kinds of uh, social constructs and so on, um, which are really much more conceptual than application. So there's, there's several schools of thought. One school of thought is that as soon as we produce OWL, a lot of very technical people think this is ready to use in an application. Another school of thought is, well, you know, it's just as formal, and everything you're seeing here is OWL constructs. They just happen to be written in a way that produces UML diagrams. There's no reason not to have OWL, but having the OWL does scare some people because it's not the same necessarily as what you would want to extract from this in a practical application. And this is something we need to explore across a range of potential users. We've talked about having a, a kind of informal user group to kick these ideas around because at the moment it's a bit of a blind man's elephant. Everybody has their own different and very strong views about whether we should or shouldn't have OWL, what should be an OWL, what should not be an OWL, whether this is even valid OWL or not, and so on. Because we've only used a very, really limited subset of the expressive power of OWL anyway to do what we've done here. You'll see that these properties don't, uh, don't come with some of the refinements that OWL properties have, for example. So that's a long answer, but uh, the answer is yes, there will be, but uh, we'll be hiding it so as not to confuse people. <laughs> okay. And Dean Alamang has volunteered uh, again, and I, I know Dean, you've mentioned this before. You're able to convert this to Al. Um, I just have to. Um, I know that Top Quadrant has stuff to convert UML to Al. Let me clarify: this is not UML. I've used the UML tool, but with the exception of generalization, which is actually common to Al and UML, nothing on this page is a UML construct. These are all Al constructs. That's the reason why it answers the executive's question. Yeah, we will produce OWL, but it's so different from the OWL that the semantic tech people like to see that we do have to be very cautious about, you know, what you can or can't do with it. But having said that, I mean, maybe we're being a bit negative because I think that we talked about people being able to assert de facto control. De facto control doesn't come with a piece of data. If a piece of data asserts de facto control, then that's an assertion. You've said what it means, and it's in data, and you can reason over it. 
So maybe there's more you can do with this conceptual owl than we've been allowing for. And that's why I really want this to be a series of conversations among all the potential users, because virtually everybody I've talked to has a very different and very strong view about what it should or shouldn't be, and they can't all be right, myself included. <laughs> okay. Um, and yes, Amanda, adaptive owl generation is automated, and uh, does it therefore leave implicit what is implicit here? Yes. And uh, so, as you noted, there's a lot of things like some of the details of what kind of object property this blue line is which are not stated here, and that then again uh, raises a lot of those kinds of interesting issues. Good, good. A long answer to a short question. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your, for your input and feedback. Um, if you don't already know, we've got our usual monthly update call for the OMG Finance Domain Task Force at 1.30. I haven't yet remembered to send out the reminder, but I will. Um, we'll be able to talk through some of those kind of issues about what is or isn't in the OWL, the conceptual model, the OMG subset of this, and so on. You'll see that I've been tidying up the architecture over here on the top left, for example. So we can dive into those kind of questions at 1.30 as well for those of a more technical or semantic uh, inclination. Um, any last minute thoughts, comments, questions before I sign off? It's, it's 10.30, 9 to 10.30. Yes, we are due to finish, yeah. Um, <laughs> anybody? Are we all good? Is everybody happy? All good. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for an excellent session. Thanks for all those clarifications. Uh, I think we're very close now to having the version that we will uh, formalize as a draft. There's more work to do between now and, and early February, but this is uh, getting us into a good place. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.